Michael is a linguist, and like many linguists, I'm a linguist as well. He claims to be monolingual. Now, what is a linguist? When someone finds out you're a linguist, what's the first question they ask? How many languages do you speak? And I always answer, well, I've studied, I don't know, maybe, I've studied you know, Spanish, Russian, you know, German. You have a list, you start going like this, and you say, but I don't speak any of them, but I've studied them. So when Michael's book came out about hyperpolyglots, I thought, well, how many can there possibly be? I, I think I met one when, in graduate school, my dissertation advisor. But that ended up not being a very interesting question as I followed Michael through his book. And you'll see, it becomes far more interesting than simply that question. Michael has advanced degrees in linguistics and rhetoric, and he's lived in South America and in Asia, where he taught English as a second language. And he joins us today to talk about his book, Babel No More, that's apparently the American version, uh, The Search for World's Most Extraordinary Language Learners. So please join me in welcoming Michael. Uh, thanks, and thanks to everyone for coming, and thanks to Anne for uh, setting this up. And it's good to see some friends, old friends, in the audience as well. So as she said, uh, I'm trained as a linguist, but for about the last decade I've been writing stories about language and languages and the people who use and study them. And the most recent story is Babel No More, which is a book about hyperpolyglots. And so in the presentation I'm going to run through some of the high points uh, uh, from the book, um, some uh, some stuff that characterizes this group of people specifically that you might know if you are one of these people uh, that you might not know uh, either way. And I'll just you know uh, second what Anne said, which is that I am not a hyperpolyglot or a polyglot uh, in any sort of regard. And some people I think have said, well, how could a monoglot write a book about this without really understanding? And once you get and spend a little bit of time around the hyperpolyglot and uh, world and that community, uh, you realize how many people really have a stake and a personal stake in uh, claiming and proving that they have uh, lots of languages. So in some ways, this is a book that could only be written by someone who doesn't have any of those claims to make uh, whatsoever. I have nothing. I have nothing to prove. Well, that's not true. I have a lot to prove, but not in that regard. Uh, so when you think of massive multilingual people or entities, you might think of, of, of this guy. Uh, anybody remember how many languages he has? Over six million. Over six million, yeah. He claims, <laughs> and a lot of them were languages of pumps, you know, so how complex can that be? But six million of them. Uh, and for, you know, this is another tool that is making people much more multilingual out in the world. Uh, 64 languages now. Only 64 languages. But I hope that after my talk and after you read the book that you will think of this guy when you think of massive multilingualism. This is Cardinal Giuseppe Mazzafonti, uh, an Italian priest and cardinal. He was born in 70, uh, 1774 and he died in 1849. Uh, he spoke what is commonly uh, and usually uh, attributed to him 72 languages or 114 languages, depending on who you talk to. Uh, I, li I love how I, like, I said 72 languages and like all the chewing stopped. <laughs> uh, so with numbers like that, you sort of want to go check it out, right? And see if, how much evidence there is, how much contemporary there ev evidence there is for actually being able to do that in all those languages. So I went to his archive in Bologna, Italy and dug around and found a lot of stuff that really demonstrates that he could do a lot of pretty advanced things in quite a lot of languages. Not 72 of them, however, but a lot of substantial stuff. And a lot of really other interesting stuff, such as uh, this, which is from a legal document that was written about 40 years after his death when his body was disinterred uh, from, its, uh, from his tomb because there was rumored to be a group of foreign language enthusiasts who were trying to get a hold of his skull. And so they dug him up to uh, make sure that his body was intact. I think also because there might have been a move to try to canonize 
Mezzofanti and the first step in the canonization process in the Roman Catholic Church is to make sure that the person's body has not been taken uh, for veneration by any other group. And so this is what they found, or an artist's rendering of what they found when they opened up uh, Mezzofanti's tomb. He was, he was all there. The other thing that I found, or another interesting thing that I found was in another box, and unlike the first box, I actually got to put my hands on the inside of this one. Uh, this was a, a box of packets of paper uh, of different sizes, uh, and when I opened the box, the librarians were like, wow, what is this stuff? Uh, they had apparently never seen it before, and I don't know how many people had ever seen it because there was no record of people having gone in this box. But you take apart the packets, and on each slip, uh, it, it, there's slips of collections of slips of paper, and on one side is written a word in one language, uh, and on the other side is written uh, another word. And I, th I went, oh my God, it's Mezzofanti's flashcards. <laughs> Uh, so the, the common notion of the polyglot or the hyperpolyglot or the talented person is that they get this stuff by osmosis. Uh, but it, in his case, anyway, it turns out to be to involve quite a lot of hard work and, and repetitive work. And you, we, you're holding, you know, he was, he was a famous, famous guy in his time. He was courted by Napoleon, visited by Russian princesses and Texan colonels. Uh, so had people, you know, Lord Byron came and had a famous swearing contest with him. Uh, and so it, it was kind of a glamorous life for a 19th century, you know, celibate man. And, uh, but he's, he was also going home and uh, before blowing out his candle, sort of working through his Persian flashcards. And I think those two things, those two images of that, this person are really instructive, uh, holding them together is very instructive. Here's another person that I write about in the book and who is very prominent in, in, in discussions of, of hyperpolyglots. His name was Emil Krebs and he was a German diplomat. He died in 1930 and when he died, uh, well, he started out uh, finishing law school and going to the German diplomatic school and saying, I want to learn all of the languages that you have. And they said, well, you can't learn all the languages. He said, okay, I want to learn the hardest one, which was Chinese. So in three years, he was certified as a Chinese translator and was posted to the, ba the diplomatic mission in Beijing, where the Empress Dowager would ask to have him come and speak Chinese to her because of all of the foreigners, his Chinese was the best. Uh, and there's lots of stories about him as this sort of famously cranky, difficult person studying languages uh, all night long, parading around his study uh, naked, uh, drunk on beer, uh, uh, which was, and he only drank beer and he only ate meat and nothing else. So, uh, and, and that kind of eccentricity is, is something that shows up a lot, but not as much as you would think it would. Uh, when he died in 1930, his family donated his brain uh, to science, and it's now housed in a, uh, a collection of genius brains in Dusseldorf. And when I went to see it, I was really excited, like, oh, there's going to be a brain floating in a jar. But of course it wasn't. They had sliced and diced it uh, a million ways. Studied it in 1931, but then uh, 2002, 2003, two German neuroscientists got a hold of it again uh, and did an analysis of the, uh, the structure of his cortical cells in the language dominant region of his brain, which would have been the left side because he was right-handed, uh, but also on the corresponding right side. And what they found was a surprising density of cell structure uh, and a symmetry in that density uh, on both left and right. They compared his brain to uh, 11 uh, control brains and they, uh, th that's how they made the determinations of the density. So it was quite, quite an unusual brain for that reason. Uh, but in the book, I, I really endeavored to try to go meet living hyperpolyglots because the Krebs is really interesting and the Mezzofanti character are really interesting. But, you know, what could they really do? They're dead, we can't assess them or whatever. Uh, so this is a woman named Helen Abadzi who works for the World Bank. She has studied 18 languages to an intermediate degree. On a regular basis, she uses all the languages of the World Bank, which is six. Um, 
and she's a program evaluator for literacy programs that the bank funds. So she'll go out you know, to Cambodia, say, in order to assess the progress of the mission and see how the, her bank money is being spent and stuff like that. Before she goes, she learns the language. Uh, not because it gets her anything, she should just be able to use English, right, which, uh, or, or some other uh, major language or colonial language, but she really believes that knowing those languages helps her uh, talk to students, understand what students are, are doing, talk to teachers, and kind of get around the official story that the officials would want to be telling her. She's interesting for, for, a couple, for a couple reasons. One, she's 61 years old, so she's definitely you know, on the older end of the hyperpolyglot scale. So she describes uh, having to do a lot more repetitive work in order to get the languages stuff into her head. And she's also interesting because she is a she. There are very, very few, relatively few women who are hyperpolyglots, both historically and contemporaneously. So doing research for the book, I did an online survey uh, of people who say that they know six or more languages and uh, only 30% of the people who answered uh, are women. And there are lots of reasons uh, that we can speculate about why that gap exists. This is somebody else that I write about in the book and uh, I posted a video on YouTube a while back uh, of him describing his daily polyglot workout which starts at 2 o'clock in the morning when he wakes up and starts working in English and then goes through German, Russian, Hindi, Persian, Arabic, Chinese uh, in 15 to 20 minute chunks. He's, he won't say how many languages he speaks uh, and I find that a, a pretty principled position to take because one of, one of the conclusions of the book is just how insufficient the notion of a language is as a unit of measure. You know, one language does not weigh, like it doesn't have a cognitive weight and they don't have the same cognitive weights uh, as each other. Uh, when he was a single assistant professor in Korea, he would spend 16 hours a day uh, working on languages in 15 to 20 minute chunks. But now he's, he's married, yes he's married, uh, and uh, he has, yes, he has two kids. He speaks Korean at home and he speaks French at home to his sons. He lives in Singapore. Uh, he has a job and so I assume that he's spending much less time actually doing language learning uh, than he used to. So these are hyperpolyglots. Um, maybe not the prettiest word in the world. Uh, it was coined by a linguist uh, Dick Hudson at U University College London who was looking for a term to capture and characterize people who spoke six or more languages. And that's not an arbitrary number. His logic was that, uh, that there are communities where everyone speaks five languages from the uneducated person to the most educated person. So it's not an, it's not a, 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 an extraordinary thing. So the people who speak six or more must, in those terms, be doing something that is fairly unusual. Uh, as you'll see, and I have a slide on this in a bit, um, I think that that number should be revised upwards uh, to, to 11. I see another polyglot in the audience here. So you're probably sitting there wondering, okay, great, 72 languages, whatever. What can these people actually do, right? which was uh, something that was really important to me too because one of the goals of the book was to try to get away from the anecdote and get away from the exaggeration and get away from the Guinness World Book of Records effect. So Guinness has somehow got itself into the business of certifying language proficiency. Uh, if you ever need you know, a certification, it's fairly easy, I think, um, from coming from Guinness. Uh, what I did for this part was I took the Interagency Language Roundtable scale, which is a US federal government scale for measuring proficiency in a number of different uh, language areas, so reading, writing, translating, listening, uh, and speaking, of course. At the time that I was working on the book, there were three of those scales that had been adapted for a self-reporting uh, scale, so you could uh, take it yourself, you know, can you, uh, can you order a meal, yes or no? Can you order a taxi, yes or no? Uh, and they increase with increasing functional difficulty uh, and where five, of course, is the educated native speaker 
uh, goal. So that's supposed to be the goal of, of language learning. I gave this particular test to uh, a guy named Graham Cansdale, who was a European Commission translator. He's like 46 or 47. He translates in 13 languages, uh, has studied languages all his life, and he, uh, he agreed to play along. The, this is the, uh, his proficiency in, in spoken language uh, in all of his languages. So what's interesting is that it's not a very high level across all of his languages. Some are fairly high, but a lot of them are quite low. And people often ask, well, how do speaking and reading differ from each other? Uh, I gave, the, um, gave him the, the reading test, and that's what his reading proficiency uh, proficiencies looks like. Uh, it's higher uh, in a lot of languages, but it also diminishes. But what's interesting is um, that you know he's working in three scripts. So it's not just a bunch of languages, it's three scripts. And it represents something like eight language families. So it's pretty considerable. Uh, and that higher distribution in the reading than the speaking, I think, reflects a couple things. One is his work as a translator, so he just gets more practice with reading than he does in speaking. Uh, and also that reading in all those languages, while a not insignificant task, also represents less of a cognitive load than online spoken communication. So it's easier to do. Then this is, uh, I, this is his, uh, his proficiency scores in the three areas, speaking, listening, and reading across all of the languages that he has, uh, arranged in order of when he learned them. So on the far left, English, his native language, French is the first one that he studied in elementary school, and then over on the far left, uh, you see Chinese. He's in Taiwan right now doing an intensive Mandarin course, not just speaking, but also learning how to read and write, and he reports that it is kicking his ass, <laughs> uh, learning to read and write. And interestingly, Mezzafonti had this, a similar sort of experience with written Chinese. It was claimed that he could speak Chinese, but uh, Mezzafonti had a, a nervous breakdown when he was faced with trying to learn how to, to read and write Chinese. And there might have been you know, typhoid or something like that involved as well, because he had fevers and ha sort of lived in this sort of feverish state for a while. And when he came out of it, he had forgotten all of his languages. Uh, except for Bolognese, which was his mother tongue. He apparently got the other languages back, but I love that story, right? Uh, it's like, don't study Mandarin, <laughs> or don't learn to read or write it. What's also interesting about this distribution is, you know, in the foreign language acquisition world, you know, uh, there, are some, there are some truisms or some theoretical aspects that are uh, supported with this, with this uh, uh, with, these, with this graph, right? So early learned languages are typically stronger, and then later learned languages are typically not. But then you have that whole middle group of languages which are surprisingly high. Uh, and I also find it's interesting it, how much difference there is among all of the languages stronger in one set of skills uh, than the other. So this is kind of the imagined uh, polyglot proficiency profile, that they must have very high abilities in all of the languages that they speak. This is kind of the additive view. Uh, and this used to be the view, and maybe still is in some quarters, of even bilinguals or trilinguals, that each of those people uh, sort of possess a monolingual native speaker's knowledge of a language just kind of glommed onto each other, and that the hyperpolyglot is just a more extreme version of that. So I've had conversations with people saying, oh, well, did Mezzafonti speak 72 languages like a native speaker? The implication being that if he didn't like a native speaker, then it's not a phenomenon that's all that interesting, right? But I'm maintaining that it is really interesting, uh, but you need to go back and make some adjustments to your expectations and to the way that you uh, count or, or describe success in foreign language learning in order to make this significant. So people's profiles typically look more like this, uh, where you have a few very high languages and then decreasing over the, as, as the uh, number of languages increase and then this sort of long tail uh, where there's hardly anything at all. Um, but not that, so at, at a moment in time, this 
proficiency profile is very dynamic and those languages that are very low over on the right hand side, they could conceivably, if they had had very high levels of proficiency in the past, uh, they claim to be able to activate them or sort of take them off ice, uh, thaw them out a little bit in order to be able to use them. So I get asked a lot, what are the hyperpolyglots like? And I kind of think that, you know, what can you say about the hyperpolyglots? And I sort of think that sometimes maybe the question is trying to get me to confess that um, they're also piano geniuses or uh, they're really good in bed or, uh, or they're just odd, like they're super, super odd. And I can't say any of that, but I can say like these things, I think these are pretty safe generalizations to make about them. They've learned how to learn. They've learned how they learn and how they learn individually. And as a result, they've, they've discovered or invented or swapped uh, methods of learning that affect them, that fit them. Uh, they like and they crave repetition. The repetitive work of looking at the flashcards or doing other things is something that they're, they're drawn to and that they crave. The language of, of addiction uh, comes up quite a lot that if people uh, don't do this, they get a little agitated, which, which suggests that there's really a very strong role for dopamine in this whole process and that these people are responding uh, very strongly to uh, uh, you know, neurological, neuromodulatory reward. Uh, they remember what they learn. They have incredible memories. They have a feel for language. Just the, the, the structure of language is something that they have uh, at their fingertips. And actually, this sort of gesture that I'm doing is something is one that the hyperpolyglots would do a lot, as if they were kind of connected to their brains and, and, and talking about the stuff they had in their brains in this very you know, textured way. Um, they find or they make a social niche for themselves. Uh, the, the, the individuals who are happiest are people who sort of have a place where learning languages and having a lot of languages even with that kind of stair step profile, is normal and even has a certain amount of social status. Um, the ones who are unhappiest are the ones who are in, just out in the community, who don't have a place in that sort of institution or that sort of organization. Uh, and the last point is one that I, that I just recently added after thinking about it a little bit. You know, either implicitly or explicitly what they're doing is they're asserting a right to not speak English and some of them report uh, some frustration or difficulties trying to work on their languages out in the world, particularly in places where the English is pretty good, and they get frustrated. And you know, I think a lot of people have uh, either heard or had experiences like trying to learn or trying to work on your Dutch, right, in the Netherlands is really hard, or Swedish and things like that. Um, So where did I start with hyperpolyglots? Uh, you know, I've studied Spanish and studied Chinese and always seen these people who are really much better than I was. And also interested in the cultural ideal of the person who can speak a lot of languages and uh, the person for whom it's very easy. And I was interested in, like, what is the fascinate, what is, what is the root of my fascination, right? Uh, and what is the root of the sort of cultural or historical fascination with this group of people? And it's not just a monolingual society. It's it, like, like the US that finds polyglots, or the UK that finds polyglots fascinating. Uh, I did some research for the book in South Asia, or South India, where people are very multilingual. And I'd say, yeah, I'm writing about this guy, Metsafanti, who spoke 72 languages. And people go, wow. That's amazing. You got to talk to my uncle. He was a diplomat and he spoke 20 languages. He's an incredible guy. Or you got to talk to this other guy who speaks 15 languages. Uh, and so there it was, you know, even this place where people were massively multilingual themselves, there was also this uh, very high regard for, uh, for people who could do things with a lot of other languages and languages that were not Indian languages. So that was the, that was the thing that was really amazing to them. Like, wow, he, he can speak Russian, he can speak Chinese, that's really amazing. So, you know, I'm interested, I was interested in exploring that, uh, the relationship that we have to that cultural ideal. The first book that I wrote, which came out in 2007, is a, a, a natural history of slips of the tongue 
and speech disfluencies, so the uhs and the ums and things like that. Uh, and it's kind of the search for the perfectly umless speaker. Like, where did we even get the notion that uh, talking without ums is to be highly regarded? Like, where did that aesthetic come from? Because clearly those things are, th are, are necessary uh, elements of uh, human communication. And if we didn't have them, uh, we wouldn't be able to communicate or we would have some other behavior uh, that the Toastmasters in this alternate universe would be trying to get, a, get rid of. <laughs> oh, people know Toastmasters. You know what's interesting about Toastmasters? They can be very, very good at eliminating us and ums from their speech or from their public speeches, and they also, and that sort of carries over into their conversation. Uh, but what ends up happening is they develop these other mechanisms for pausing, so they, 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 they'll, they'll, they'll do this. Uh, and they never get dinged according to Toastmaster rules because there's, it's all about us and ums, not about repetitions. Um, and another reason, I mean, I think in, in a lot of ways, like a really big reason and a really big attraction for me of the hyperpolyglots was just that no one had ever like taken them seriously. It was really like this, that's a giant squid, uh, which you know, may or may not exist. I guess there are people who are convinced that it does. But the hyperpolyglot was, uh, it, you know, people had anecdotes for the sort of folklore about you know uh, high school teachers who could speak 18 languages and uncles you know or, or things like that, but no one had ever assessed like okay what can they actually do? Uh, so I set out to write the book to not only uh, write some of the anecdote because the stories are really cool, but to try to actually put some numbers on this. Uh, there's a funny moment when I'm in Italy and I'm meeting with a, another guy, this uh, Italian historian who's written a book about Mezzofonte as a librarian, and I said, I need, to, I need to count stuff. And he's like, you're a positivist. And he punches me in the shoulder. I was like, you're a positivist. I was like, well, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you're a positivist. So another reason you know, to pay attention to the hyperpolyglots is that like, we need them. We, we need to understand the sort of cognitive capital that they have and how they got it uh, and how they wield it. So in all of this, I'm really interested in the question of, of how do you make more language learners and how do you make more, more better language learners, right? Not just in the US, but everywhere. Like, so l l uh, learning languages is like the human condition in a lot of ways right now, uh, and not just learning human languages, but learning uh, 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 machine languages as well. So the way that I tell that story in the book is through this notion of the neural tribe. Uh, and it's a way of sort of starting with the notion that human brains are all different from each other, right? And that's actually a, an evolutionary asset for the species. So because we have different brains, we learn differently, we solve problems in different ways. And that the people who are very good at learning languages or doing some similar behavior, right, uh, is one of those types of brains and that they are selected by certain kinds of environments in order to be able to wield uh, the particular neurology that they have. Um, uh, and there are a number of ways to characterize that neurology and, to, and in the book I speculate a lot about directions that that might, that that, uh, that that might take, including uh, plasticity, including a particular uh, memory function, so hippocampal, um, uh, something special about the hippocampus and, and, other, and other things. So they're selected by the environment. It's a non-deterministic account, right? I'm not saying that if you have that brain, you'll become a hyperpolyglot. You have to have that brain and you have to have access to the resources. You have, act, have to have, you know, be living in a culture where this is a given status and, and whatever. And those things start to feed back on each other. And what that does is creates a, an identity a sense of an eye, like, hey, I'm a language learner. This is what I do. Uh, and then a sense of a personal mission, like I'm going to start traveling to these places. And I'm going to like, cook up a project that's invo that involves lots of languages. And I'm going to uh, be on the lookout for native speakers in those languages because I like to practice that. Um, and another thing that is uh, 
that's crucial about the neural tribe is that they're kind of these extra institutional or subnational. I mean, they're very, they are very tribal in that sense. The way that they learn languages and the things that they use their languages for are largely not things that institutions find valuable. So doing research for the project, you know, I went to the Defense Language Institute and the Foreign Service Institute and said, hey, polyglots, you know any polyglots? And they're just not interested in the people who can speak lots of languages to fairly low uh, levels of proficiency because their whole task is about taking, in the, taking adults, taking monolingual English-speaking adults and turning them into bilinguals who can work as diplomats or spies, people who can basically blend in to whatever the native population is. So this is a totally different orient. Uh, according to those institutional rules, the hyperpolyglot looks like a failed language learner, right? Uh, and being extra institutional in this way also gives them the freedom to basically be experimenting on themselves uh, cognitively and pedagogically, inventing stuff, trying stuff out that, that might work uh, with them on their brains. So these are some results from the survey that I did. Uh, and on the left, you have people who uh, know more than six languages. And I left that just however they wanted to report that. That was, that was fine. On the left are you know, people who reported that language, learning languages was easier for them uh, than for other people. Um, in both groups, you know, the number of men is 70%. Uh, they're not all that old, but I, I was surprised to see that many people in the 25 to 40 year old range because I had sort of thought that maybe, okay, maybe if you have this neurology, right, that you, that that, that would have been something that was siphoned off by access to uh, programming environments and programming uh, uh, professions and stuff like that. Um, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And I, and I don't know how much of an overlap there is and I can uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, but I was surprised to see so many young people in both groups. Um, multilingualism is not necessarily a precursor to uh, hyperpolyglotism. It, it, some, some, people, some people start that way, but not all of them do. Uh, and then as far as IQ distribution, I kind of mistrust that. These were self-reported IQs. That seems really high to me, uh, but I just stick it here. And then they were from all over the world. You know, the survey, it was in English. It was circulated on English language blogs. I don't think that it really got that far into Asia or non -English, the non-English uh, part of the internet. So, you know, there are lots, it's not a, it's, it's an unreliable sample um, in a lot of ways. This is that chart of uh, repertoire size or collection size that I was talking about before. So, you know, I have a bunch of people with 60 languages and then decreasing numbers, but it really bottoms out at 11. So that for me is maybe the new sort of floor uh, of what it means or what it requires to be a hyperpolyglot, about 11 languages. Those two other graphs there are uh, how, you know, uh, what's the contribution uh, of being or growing up uh, with more than one mother tongue? And then what's the contribution of talent or something innate versus something else. And the contribution of talent is much higher than uh, growing up with more than one mother tongue. These are some characteristics of that group who had more than 11 languages. Overwhelmingly male. Uh, they were an older group, which sort of makes sense. I mean, it takes you a little more time to accumulate all those languages. But I'll just go back to this. You know, the highest number that I got reported was 26 languages. So the next time you meet somebody who says, yeah, I speak 50 languages, I mean, keep that, keep that into account. Uh, I asked people, so this is kind of a cross of the two groups of so people with more than six languages who said that learning is easier for them. There were 145 of them. I asked them why they thought that was the case. Uh, innate talent, I'm intelligent, I work harder, I'm more motivated, it's part of my background, I have a good education, I like languages, my parents are good language learners. Uh, people were not giving very much credit to their parents and giving a ton of credit to attitude, right, or what looks like attitude, I like languages, right, in the 90%. But I'm really curious, like, what does 
I like languages actually mean. You know, it's I like, I like the way that my mouth sounds or the way that my mouth feels when I speak Japanese, right? Or is it I like the way that a member, you know, a, a, another attractive person looks at me when I speak Japanese, right? Or I like what I like the way that my brain feels when I'm doing, uh, when I'm trying to speak Japanese or when I'm learning Japanese or things like that. So. Uh, that high number doesn't surprise me, but I, I wouldn't say that that is entirely all uh, attitude, you know, a positive attitude about uh, foreign languages or being multilingual necessarily. So one of the explanations that's been offered for uh, this particular neurology is called the geshwin galliberta hypothesis. And it was first developed in the 80s and the story sort of goes like this, that uh, at a particular moment in the developing fetus, that the uh, presence of or exposure to a certain level of testosterone uh, changes and create, changes uh, the migration of neuronal cells in the brain and creates these patterns of impairment slash gifts so that you can end up with someone who is visuospatially uh, gifted but verbally impaired or vice versa. And that vice versa case would, could potentially be the, the hyperpolyglot. Um, and it was originally uh, sort of formulated in, try, in order to try to combine some of the insights or, or some observed correlations between things like uh, left-handedness and uh, immune disorder, or left-handedness and maleness, or maleness and dyslexia. So it's a kind of a, a global, uh, an attempt to give a global explanation to all of those phenomena. And I asked some geshwin galliberta questions on the survey and did not find anything interesting or significant statistically except in two areas. One people were reporting higher levels of immune disorder, either for themselves and for their families, uh, than was statistically predicted, and also higher levels of uh, homosexual identification, behavior, or orientation than was predicted. You know, it's a problematic set of questions, to be sure, because measuring handedness turns out to not all, not be, um, not be, uh, not be all that straightforward and, and you know, certainly asking the homosexuality question, uh, you've got to be really careful. So I'll just, I should have prefaced that, but I'll post this that and say, you know, I'm not saying that people who are hyperpolyglots are gay, I'm saying, or left-handed or anything. I'm saying that this particular theory says that, uh, it predicts that it's, it's about likelihood, right? It's about probability and it's about, um, not necessarily probability in an individual, but in a family. So these are some of the implications, I think, um, and just some of the implications of some of this. One of which is for language learning in general, obviously, and I get a lot of questions about how can, uh, well, you know, what is the hyperpolyglot secret? And the secret is, unfortunately, there's no secret uh, that is global or uniform. What you do have are, are, are secrets that are particular to individuals, I think. Um, and one of the ways to find that out is to really work on profiling yourself. So what, is, what are your learner preferences? What is your cognitive style? And then going out and finding methods uh, that, that work for you. Uh, improve your higher order cognitive skills. So get working on that working memory trainer um, and executive function trainer. So you could you know, be working on a language and doing your dual end back you know, iPhone app you know, on the treadmill and the two things, the two things will arguably or theoretically be, be enhancing each other and the, the federal government is working on research uh, exactly in this area and showing a very high degree of correlation between language aptitude and working memory skills. So the, the, the degree to which you can get your working memory stronger, uh, your language learning will, will, will go better. So there's the psycho-emotional preparation, there's the, the neuromodulation, managing dopamine and other kinds of things. Thinking about 
starting to think about the role of hormones in the role of language learning uh, can take sort of put an interesting spin on some language learning folklore. So the whole notion that the best way to learn a foreign language is to uh, get a lover who speaks the other language, which you think of as you know about you want to impress them. It's about uh, it's about access to you know certain kinds of native performances and things like that. It's also about oxytocin, right? And it's also about uh, maybe mimicking or jacking up oxytocin levels as an adult that would have been present uh, as a child learning language. So it's kind of reduplicating that uh, that kind of hormonal environment. And two other things, build community. You know, learning language is not just something that individuals do or should undertake, but something that they're doing with, with other people. These are some, I think, broader policy questions. Uh, and these are some questions more for the foreign language learning group. Some theoretical things as well. Uh, and I'll just close with this, which is a line from the book, you know. Who are, like, what are humans inherently? Are we inherently multilingual? And have we just been, has that just kind of been squashed by the monolingual nation state? And are we looking towards some future, some sort of post-national utopia where the sort of monolingual nation state's boot is being lifted from people's brains and we're kind of expanding back into our sort of multilingual sort of right, right? I think that's some of why or some of what is so fascinating about the hyperpolyglot, you know, because they seem to be these fossils from the past, but also sort of contain or speak to like what human potential actually is and the potential that's coming. Uh, thanks very much. That's the end of my talk. Some, I know people always usually have really, uh, want to talk and have some interesting questions, so I want to leave some time for that too. Thanks. I wanted to ask. Well, I'll just, I want to spread it out. Um, do you think with globalization that people are going to become more multilingual or simply settle into a few common languages that everyone's going to speak? I think that you're, so my argument would be that you're certainly going to see more hyperpolyglots because what you have is a, you know, what you have are the proliferation of environments and the proliferation of resources that people have access to, right, that would give that neurology something to work on. So, yeah. I guess this is kind of a related question, but have, have you seen anything about, about the increase or decrease in, in the rates of polyglots um, recently with the, with the rise of the internet and all these technologies like, you know, Google Translate, you know, Skype, Google Plus Hangouts, things like that, where it's much, much easier to build communities with people in other countries and other languages. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's huge. I think it's exploding. I mean, so, so these used to be people who were living, who were isolated from their communities, right? And where being a hyperpolyglot, even in a multilingual community, to add one language, to add another language, brings you further away from your community, right? But the internet gives people the the power and the license such that when they learn a language, learn another language, they're actually becoming part, they're part of becoming part of a community and it's a broader global community. Uh, it's still imagined, you know, uh, it's, it's still not there. And sometimes and increasingly those communities are hyper poly, are polyglot communities or hyper polyglot communities. So you can go on YouTube and you can search for polyglot videos and there's a whole set of, you know, sort of rituals and performances uh, that they do for each other and uh, quite a lot of hazing that goes on. So I don't know if you saw the uh, stuff about this 16-year-old kid, Tim Doner, from New York City who uh, was profiled in March. And he claims to speak 23 languages and had done some stuff online. And the kid just got sort of criticized up and down by the older folks who were part of the community and really uh, really hazing him in a way. It was sort of a fascinating sort of phenomenon. It looks like everything has settled down. But yeah, absolutely, there are more of them. I'm interested in what you found out about the uh, decay and ability. Um, 
you know, I used to lead a team of, of people who had to speak a lot of languages, and we had one guy who, on his resume, was 22, and we actually tested him with native speakers, and he could do 10 fluently, according to the native speakers. 10 fluently? Yes. Yeah, well. so, so, so it seems like there's a difference. I mean, some people have this decay and some people don't, and mm -hmm. I'd be interested in what you uh, saw in your research. Yeah, so, uh, it, I mean, there, there, is, there, is, there is the decay, and it tends to be, you know, it's connected to, to practice, but it's also linked to that issue that people had of um, feeling really confident and being able to like resuscitate or reactivate the languages with just a little bit of time. So for them, you know, it was almost like they could introspect and they could feel that the language was still there, but they could get it back. Uh, they could get it back very easily. So, so out of the ones that could uh, speak twenty, how many were like fluent or close to fluent in all twenty, and how many had some decay after say five? Yeah, so the ability to speak, you know, to have lots of languages activated at the same time is a, an, an executive function question and a working memory question. And there seems to be an architecture to executive function such that it just caps that ability at a certain point. So I think that it's like five to nine, regardless of the overall size of the repertoire that people were limited to on, just on a daily basis where they don't have to do any sort of active um, and maybe this gets to your question, any active study in order to be able to speak that, language, that, that number of languages. In the book, I write about these two contests that were held in Belgium, one in 1987 and one in 1990, where people were tested in as m all of the languages that they knew, and the two guys who won both years uh, had some amount of 22 languages. And when I first heard that, I thought, oh, that's, I mean, that's incredible to be able to just walk into a, walk into a room, have a 10-minute conversation, five-minute break, 10-minute conversation, five-minute break across 22 languages. But when I actually ended up speaking to them, it was clear that they didn't live their lives like that. You know, they had five or six languages just on a regular basis. And for the purposes of the contest, they had really revved their engines up. But the next day, they went back to their regular lives. So it seems like uh, both you and some of the hyperpolyglots that you interviewed um, place a really high emphasis on getting the speech sounds of the language right. Uh, like when we talk about shadowing with Alexander, he's like, do it more Italian. -y. So but if I were learning a language, like a new language, I would think that uh, getting the accent right would be one of the last things that I would do. Because I could at least be functional, uh, but still have an accent, especially if it was a language like English, which has tons of different accents. So can you explain why you put such a high value on, on getting that accent right as one of the first steps? Mm. So I don't know. I don't know that I would necessarily say that. I mean, what I found that it was interesting about uh, when I asked the people in the survey how they defined knowing a language, when they talked about oral communication, right? They said they didn't say anything about doing anything like a native does, including pronunciation. And a lot of them, I mean, people like Alexander, he'll say, "Yeah, you want to be. I want to be familiar with the sounds of a language." But I'm not necessarily going to be so focused on, like, but so what if I have an accent? And there were a couple of people that said, yeah, that actually sounding, like getting the accent really, really right before the rest of your skills are really good can get you in some dangerous situations. So you walk in, I mean, I can say bonjour very pretty well in Quebec, right? I go, bonjour. And they go, oh, no, 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 I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to be too good, you know, too early. I have a question about the, uh, the sort of discrete counting of the individual languages. I reminded of the story of a uh, uh, linguistics professor at Columbia who was asked one time, well, how many languages do you speak? He was sort of taken aback. He said, I speak all the languages of Europe. This sort of gave me the impression that, that you, once you learn some number of languages, especially with related language groups, like say the languages of Europe, then you have some sort of understanding, insight into the rest of the languages. And you might be able to, to speak one that you've never even come across before. Is that really true, or, or is it really you, you spend a lot of time developing some particular distinct language and then you switch to some other one for a while? Uh, yeah, so I mean, research shows that people who are bilingual or multilingual, kind of on a community basis or family basis, do acquire other languages easier, and there are reasons for that. And the hyperpolyglots report the same sort of thing, you know, and that it took like five or six languages for them to be able to have that additional. Uh, sort of boost. And it's a matter of 
you know, okay, given, given this grammatical structure, what do, what do I anticipate also being true, right? And then basically building a little hypothesis in your head and then confirming that or not, or... So when you can speak, say, 22 languages like you were talking about, does that, does that really have any meaning? Say that anymore, or is this really just about being able to, to speak, say, in 22 different accents of related languages? Uh, could you ask that again? Because there's a couple ways I could take that. Well, I'm just wondering, what, what does it really mean to say I, I, you know, speak 22 languages versus another couple that, you know, maybe very versus 25? Or like I have 27 languages and you only have 25, so maybe, I'm smarter than you are. Maybe I only have 16, but the rest of them are just different. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a fascinating, that's an incredible question. And what's interesting is you can kind of back that down to smaller numbers of languages, right? So what does it mean to say that a monolingual English speaker, right? I mean, English is this huge language and so many people have access to and they can reproduce lots of different dialects, they can understand them, they have, you know, they can move up, they, they can reproduce, they can talk with, certain, with a lot of registers, right? They only have one language, though. You puny little American, right? But there are people who, well, they speak six languages. But then you dig into that six, and like, well, you know, the vocabularies in those languages are pretty small, and they use them for just these narrow things, and um, they have the languages they speak a lot, and the other ones that they say that they know, they just, it's, it's very receptive. Their abilities are more receptive. So it, unless you dig into, the complexity of what, that's why, you know, relying on the numbers of languages is this, is this total, like, convenience that's really inconvenient, uh, or the other way around, because it, it hides a lot more than it actually reveals about what people have in their heads and what they're able to do. Yeah. So, I thought another thing that you said that was interesting was that people like the Foreign Service Institute and the Defense Language Institute don't are interested in polyglots, and uh, you know, some of the, the language learning that I've seen are things like Barry Farber's how to you know how to learn any language, and you know it sounds like this guy's at least in some sense a hyper polyglot, um, and you know he teaches you all these techniques. Are, are the techniques that you use really only going to give you you know are they, are they tuned to hyper polyglots and getting like a superficial understanding, or are they are, are the techniques you, he uses to learn a language? the same techniques that, that the Defense Language Institute uses, and you know, what are the differences in the two teaching methodologies, learning pedagogies? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think DLI and that approach really imagines a more, like a very uniform kind of language acquisition process. But are, I mean, are they doing the same things, or are they, you know, because they have different, do they have different targets, or they're actually using different techniques to learn the languages too? Uh, different targets and different techniques. And, and yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if there's uh, any correlations between if you're being like hyper polyglot, you're more sensitive with uh, like cultural issues because they're more easy, like compared to us, they're more easy to access different cultures or different, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you, it was a question about culture, and you said, you know, given, given their given their abilities in a lot of different languages, do they also have the same sort of heightened knowledge of culture as well, right? Yeah, and it sort of depends. It depends on who they are and what they're, what they're interested in. Some of them are really interested in, you know, the culture of the language, and some of them, it's just, uh, they're, they're learning the structure, they're learning the grammar and the sounds. So you had Esperanto in the mix, which is a artificial language. Um, why did you not have C++ in the mix? <laughs> <laughs> or to say it differently, um, programming languages, while they are less complex in some ways than natural language, they do involve a lot of the same cognitive involvement to actually learn them, the same techniques that work for, say, learning French work actually for learning programming languages. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's my next book, really. Um, and I've seen some discussions about, you know, how many, pro how many, how many languages can people program in and, uh, and stuff like that. 
Uh, I asked people who were hyperpolyglots if they also programmed, if they played musical instruments, and there was a little bit of there was a little bit of overlap. Some of those questions I don't really talk about them that much because it seemed like people were giving the the socially acceptable answer rather than the real answer in some ways. Um, if people wanted to, you know, I, I, I said, how many languages do you know? And I didn't get anyone who reported a, a, a programming language. If they had, I might have put it on the, uh, I might have included it, but it, was, it happened very, very rarely. Um, so, there's, so there's that issue. And I think what's also interesting is, uh, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the kind of trend towards speaking a lot of languages to some level of proficiency in order to be able to manage your Facebook feed or t to, to manage these emerging forms of interaction, particularly online, is really analogous to um, the, the polyglot programming thing, right, and those sorts of arguments. So is the, is the hyperpolyglot programmer just someone who doesn't have a lot of languages very, very well, right? Are they failed programmers or is there, is there a, a, a virtuosity in their multilinguistic skills, right? Uh, and I'm interested in, I'd be interested in, in finding out more and writing some about uh, polyglot programming. I have a question from one of our BC rooms dialed in. And they want you to talk a little bit more about the relationship between a language and living in a particular place. Did you find that the hyperpolyglots lived in the places where the, um, in the countries whose languages that they spoke? Um, I think there's a slide about that. So it really, it really varied. You know, some of them had traveled extensively and lived for long periods of time in places where there were languages that they had. Um, but of the people who, of the 17 people who had more than 11 languages, 62% um, of them were living in the same country uh, where they were born. So there was not a huge amount of mobility there. What was sort of the highest, or the, the polyglot with the most languages who was basically illiterate in all of them? So who just learned it all orally? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I mean, the people that I described uh, in that, that contest in Belgium uh, in 87 and 90, they weren't illiterate, but they were doing oral, they were performing orally. So those were, the, in both cases, 22 languages. Uh, and I take the second guy to his performance to be a little more meaningful or powerful or whatever because the rules were different. Uh, the rules were, were stricter. So in the first case, the hyperpolyglots had, a, the contestants sort of had this ability to, you know, go in and, and start talking about whatever they wanted to and the judges kind of let them do that. In, in the second contest, the judges were explicitly instructed, you know, whatever the person starts talking, get them off that topic because, you know, they're going to just talk to their strengths, but you want to get them, you know, move them off. And that's actually one of the ways that oral proficiency uh, interviews are, are conducted. So I sort of take the second guy's performance as more telling. So 22 languages? That doesn't get to your, your question exactly, and I know what you're driving to, but I didn't find anybody who, who was, um, illiterate in, in all of their languages. But I noticed that when you showed this, the first slide with the guy's proficiency, that he, um, Arabic, he was decent at Arabic, but then in the writing, he, d he was totally illiterate, for example. Yeah. And I, mean, I don't know, I think for a, lo for a lot of us, if we're going to learn Arabic or Chinese, just screw the writing and just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.